Most people think of the Victorian era as the age of steam, and yet there was another revolution going on at the same time. In 1820, the Danish scientist Hans Christian Ørsted had shown that if you pass an electric current through a wire near a compass, the needle kicks. Do you see that? It's twitching as the current flows. And what's happening is you're making a new magnetic field by the current flowing through the wire. And so he invented the science of electromagnetism. Now, the work was carried on by people like Ampere and Faraday, but I was surprised to find that the most important practical advances were made by a man who was born here in Whittington, near Kirby Lonsdale, in 1783. He was a poor cobbler's son, he never went to school, and yet he invented the electric motor. His name was William Sturgeon. Sturgeon's father was an idle cobbler who treated his son dreadfully following his wife's death. He even used to take him poaching at Devil's Bridge. Local legend has it that one night there was a terrible storm and they sheltered from the rain under the bridge and all around lightning was flashing like mad. And William was inspired by the lightning to study nature's electricity. By the time he was 19, Sturgeon had had enough of the life of a poor shoemaker and escaped by joining the army. He borrowed books from officers in return for mending their shoes. When he left the army, Sturgeon devoted his life to the electricity and the newfangled science of electromagnetism. He made his living by demonstrating smart apparatus to the public. In 1847, the annals of Kirby Lonsdale Church report an advertisement that he was going to give a series of lectures at this very pub, which was then called the Green Dragon. They were about electricity and optics. And the advertisement promised that the room would be warmed and of a proper temperature. Well, let's find out whether it still is. In 1823, he turned Ersted's idea into a practical device, the electromagnet. He already knew that if you pass a current along a wire, you get a magnetic field. But he had two cunning ideas. First, coil the wire into a coil to concentrate the field, and then concentrate it further by wrapping it round a piece of iron. Well, I'm actually using a steel bolt, but the effect is much the same. Now, if you look, that is not magnetic. But if I pass a current through this coil, watch what happens. Look at that. I've got a powerful electromagnet. He made a magnet strong enough to pick up its own weight in iron, much the strongest magnet that had been made at that point. Then he thought, wouldn't it be great if you could use both ends of the magnet, because the magnetic force is concentrated at the ends, the poles here. And he wondered how to do that, and then he came up with a brilliantly simple solution. You bend it round into a horseshoe. So here we have another steel bolt with a coil of wire around it, and here are the two ends, so we can use them both. So, like that. And now, it's quite powerful. We may even be able to pick up a third bolt. Let's just try this. Look at that we've got a powerful electromagnet. With his, he was able to pick up 20 times the weight of the magnet. With his electromagnet, Sturgeon went on to invent the world's first electric motor. Michael Faraday got a magnetic needle spinning in a dish of mercury, but it was only a toy. Now, here is one of Sturgeon's horseshoe electromagnets, and here is another one mounted on a shaft so it can rotate. And I'm going to connect them both up like this, that one to this battery, and this one to this battery. And you can see these magnets are attracted to one another. But if I reverse the connections, the opposite happens, and they're repelled. So if you hold them together, they spin apart. And he realized that if he could arrange that they, if this spun round, and at the same time he could change the connections on the battery, he could make it attract, repel, attract, repel, and so what would happen, it would go attract, repel, attract, repel, and it would spin on and on, and there would be an electric motor. But how was he going to do these connections? How could they possibly switch at exactly the right time? And then he realised he could use the shaft as the switch, and he invented this, this brilliant device, the commutator. Now, actually, it's just a piece of copper pipe jammed onto this broomstick, and I've sawn two gaps in it. You see, look, there's one gap there, and there's one gap there. One half is connected to one end of this wire, and the other half is connected to the other half of this wire. So as this turns round, I supply power to these terminals here. The brass battery wire on this side is connected alternately to the left, then the right, then the left side of the magnet. 
the battery wire on the other side switches at exactly the same time, but to the opposite side of the magnet. So with a bit of luck... And look at that. An electric motor. Isn't that absolutely brilliant? The brilliant part are the horseshoe magnet and the commutator, which switches the battery connections each time it turns round. And so with this device, the cobbler's son from Whittington produced the world's first practical electric motor. Despite this amazing achievement, the motor didn't actually make him any money. He was eventually reduced to pushing his apparatus around Manchester in a cart, earning a meagre wage from occasional lectures. Although his funeral was attended by famous scientists, including James Jewell, who had enormous respect for him, he didn't get any credit for all his work during his lifetime. And it wasn't much better after he died. His, his gravestone here was completely lost for many decades and turned up only about five years ago when a gardener uncovered it by chance. And all it says on it is William Sturgeon, the electrician. But Sturgeon's improvements and adaptations did for electrical power what James Watt had done for steam. And now, electric motors of Sturgeon's design are found in everything from hair dryers to bicycles. <laughs>